Good afternoon. My name is Gustavo Fernandez. I'm a senior partner at the regional office of Tawir Shecker and Mayor Brown, and I'm a member of the firm's litigation international arbitration practices. Uh, joining me today uh, here as co-presenter is Alison Stowell. Alison is a senior associate in Mayor's Brown New York office and a member of the firm's international arbitration practice. Uh, before we begin, I have a few housekeeping announcements. First, as we go along, we hope that you ask questions by using the Q&A panel on the right side of your screen. We will make every effort to answer your questions toward the end of the webinar. However, if we are unable to answer your questions during the presentation, we will follow up with you directly once the webinar has ended. Second, uh, regarding CPD and CLE credits, we will be providing an alphanumeric code at some point during the presentation. In order to receive credits, participants must record this code on the virtual signing sheet that was made to you with the login instruction for today's program. Uh, finally, I have one caveat. The views that Alice and I express today here are our own and should not be attributed to our firm or our clients. With that, let's get started. Uh, we, we have a structure of presentation here today in, into four topics about arbitration in Brazil. <laughs> uh, the first topic we, we, we call, we name it as the explosion of arbitration in Brazil, which is intended to explain why in, in so few years uh, Brazil has become one of the most uh, users of arbitration in the world. Uh, in, in our second section, we will discuss briefly the, some of the features of domestic arbitration in Brazil. Uh, uh, on the third section, we, we will address uh, the recent change in the law here in Brazil, which now provides that arbitrations with the state or public administration is allowed by, by, by law. And uh, at the end of our presentation, we discuss some issues regarding uh, uh, foreign arbitrations and how they play a, a role here in Brazil. Uh, with that in mind, I now pass uh, to Alison we'll uh, explore the first section our, of our presentation, which is entitled Explosion of Arbitration. Thank you, Gustavo. Uh, like Gustavo said, my name is Allison Stowell, and I'm in Mayor Brandt's New York office. I'll start off by talking about the reason why we're all here today. The, significant growth that has occurred in the use of arbitration among Brazilian parties. First, there are key, a few key events to keep in mind that have really caused uh, this explosion of growth. The first is that in 1996, Brazil adopted its arbitration law. From the start, this law was based on the new UNCITRAL model and so incorporated international norms as supporting international arbitration. Then five years later, the Brazilian Supreme Court declared this law constitutional. And from that declaration, along with Brazil becoming party to the New York Convention a year later, that is really the point uh, at which this growth in arbitration can really be attributed to. So let's talk about uh, some numbers just to illustrate this growth. The use of arbitration has increased both um, internationally and cross-border transactions and disputes as well as domestically between Brazilian parties themselves. Between 2008 and 2014, the number of ICC arbitrations involving Brazilian parties tripled. By the time 2014 that came around, only France and the U.S. had more nationals involved in ICC arbitrations. Domestically, that growth is even greater between 2010 and 2015, within five years, the number of arbitrations filed in the six largest Brazilian institutions increased uh, by over 50 percent, so that 222 new arbitrations were filed in 2015. And just as a point of reference, Brazil has a couple hundred 
domestic arbitration institutions. So those six are, are the largest, but that is by no means the only new arbitrations that were initiated in, in 2014. That in 2015, I'm sorry, that, that same year in 2015, Brazil modernized its arbitration law by uh, amending it with the 2015 amendments. Those amendments clarified some issues and questions that had arisen while this growth took place. And so Brazil now has a fully um, modern arbitration, arbitration law. Another thing that's significant about this growth in the use of arbitrations is the amount in dispute. So in domestic arbitrations, the average amount in dispute was in 2005 was 11 million HAIs. And in 2015, that has increased to 48 million HAIs on average for the amount in dispute. So this signifies that not only are parties increasingly turning to arbitration as a means to resolve their disputes, they're also using it for more complex commercial transactions um, to, to resolve any disputes that arise in those. There are a few reasons that are driving this growth. The first one is that overburden courts are causing the government to really support arbitration as a matter of public policy. And so um, last year there were nearly 100 million cases that were pending in the courts. So the use of arbitration and other means of dispute resolutions are seen as a means of unclogging the court system in Brazil. Then. Also, even though the economy is currently in recession, the investment by foreign investors continues in, uh, to be a significant factor in the economy. Brazil was still the um, received the, the most, the highest amount of foreign investment in 2015 among Latin American countries, and that. Um, appears to be continuing. There are significant opportunities in the Brazilian economy for foreign investors over the coming years, including the Petrobras uh, divestments that will total over $15 billion in assets between uh, 2015 and 2019. Then another reason why we expect the growth to continue is that the 2015 amendment to the Brazilian law now authorizes direct and indirect public administration or the Brazilian government to arbitrate disputes that involve disposable economic rights. Those disposable economic rights are rights that can be valued monetarily, so there are economic rights. Um, finally, even though Brazil is not an ICSID member, it has begun to enter into agreements called cooperation and facilitation investment agreements with uh, Angola, Malawi, Mexico, Mozambique, and Colombia, and each of these permit interstate arbitration. Now, as we turn to and, and discuss um, more detailed aspects about arbitrating in Brazil, one principle to keep in mind uh, that is common throughout international arbitration, but um, it's constitutional in Brazil, is that uh, their constitution has and provides an overarching framework of a right to due process. So the Constitution provides that uh, no one shall be deprived of freedom or of his assets without the due process of law. Uh, the arbitration law and the 2015 amendments and case law continue to reflect this right to 
due process. It's codified in the arbitration law at Article 21, which states that the principles of adversary proceeding equal treatment of the parties, impartiality of the arbitrator, and freedom of decision shall always be respected. And this right of due process provides an overarching framework for arbitration and we'll discuss um, after providing the CL. <laughs> slides are uh, in a different order. So this, this overarching principle of due process um, you know, affects certain elements of Brazilian law. So in ensuring that um, arbitration agreements and that are entered into and any awards that are issued under them are enforceable, it's important to keep in mind this principle of due process. I'll give just one example of how this right could intersect with the arbitration law. So under the arbitration law, parties have very wide latitude in selecting the rules of law or equity that govern an arbitration under the express language of the Arbitration Act. Here you can see that the sole requirements are that the choice of law cannot violate good morals and public policy. Despite this wide latitude, a party would want to be sure that it's selecting a law that complies with due process requirements. Um, for example, selecting a, a law or general principles that are seldomly used or would fall outside of international norms may potentially raise questions about the enforceability of an award. There, there are then a few other unique uh, specific aspects of arbitrating in Brazil that are noteworthy and Gustavo will address those. Okay, thank you, Alison. Now let's uh, turn to uh, domestic arbitration. Uh, the overall comment about the, our law here in our Arbitration Act is that it, it, it gives party great autonomy to uh, assess the proceeding as they see fit. So one of the features, for example, is that uh, uh, no requirement for counsel, parties may represent themselves during the arbitration, and uh, uh, arbitrators uh, uh, do not need to be Brazilians, even if the arbitration is in Brazil, and, and, and also the arbitrators do not need to be uh, lawyers. You can have a panel with the engineers, the accountants, as the parties prefer. Uh, it, it, it has become a practice of some of the local institutions to restrict the selections of arbitrators to a roster. So in some arbitral institutions in Brazil, uh, normally uh, the chair of the arbitral tribunal is normally and needs to be selected by, from a roster that that institution provides. Uh, the law has been amended, the Brazilian Act has been amended in 2015 to allow parties to, uh, uh, to change that and to specify that they do not want to, uh, to choose the chair from the, uh, 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 the roster. Uh, the new Act, also, the, the amendment to the Act has also uh, uh, included some new features. Uh, one of them regards statute of limitations. Uh, before the amendment, uh, uh, some tribunals in Brazil were applying the rules of the Code of Civil Proceedings uh, uh, to determine whether uh, uh, a statute of limitation had stopped running. Uh, now we have a, a specific provision for that that provides that once the arbitration is initiated, and the tribunal is constituted, then you have a, a, a stop in the statute of, of, of limitation. And uh, the tribunal is constituted according to Brazilian law once all the members accept uh, uh, the, the nomination. And, but once 
uh, that is, uh, uh, is, 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 is accepted, then the date to consider the stop for statute of limitation goes back to the date in which the parties uh, the party, the claimant, file their their requests uh, for arbitration. Uh, and, and and just one additional comment: the, the the several changes to this to the, the Brazilian Arbitration Act, which have been introduced in the 2015, uh, they uh, as a general matter, what they intended to do was to some extent to reflect the practice uh, that. Uh, legal scholars and courts uh, had already implemented by their interpretation of the law. There has been no real uh, significant departure of any relevant principle uh, that the law had embraced since, to, since 1996. Uh, entering measures, uh, again, the law has been amended to make it clear as Again, as courts and, and, and commentators had already uh, established, that uh, jurisdiction for entering measures from court only occur before the tribunal is constituted. Once the tribunal is constituted, uh, the jurisdiction is of the arbitrators to grant entering measures, to modify, to, to reverse, it's uh, and and they they can issue whatever interim measures they see fit to protect the rights discussed in the arbitration. Uh, again, this this is uh, a, a a reflection in the law of of a case law that courts in Brazil had been adopted by from 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 quite a while, uh, and 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 also. Uh, to reflect the fact that some of our arbitration institutions uh, have provisions allowing arbitral tribunals to grant entry and provisional measures. Uh, one, one really relevant issue that had not been addressed uh, by uh, the amendment of the, of the Arbitration Act was uh, the issue of multi-party arbitration and multi-party contracts. Uh, this uh, this has been a problem in in, in some cases in Brazil. Uh, first, because uh, most of the arbitration institutional rules of the domestic institutions they do not have a specific rules for consolidation. Some institutions are now changing their rules to reflect that. So uh, to be on the safe side here, also considering that there is no uh, relevant or significant case law uh, addressing uh, uh, how multi-party arbitration should be dealt with, uh, the, the, the proper role here is for, for parties to provide for consolidation uh, in their arbitration agreement. Uh, for example, in, 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 in shareholders' agreements disputes or in infrastructure disputes where you have a uh, chain of contracts, it's, it's, it's common that the, the issues of consolidation, of consolidation emerge and, and not all arbitral tribunals are, are inclined to allow for consolidation unless there is some real clear provision indicating that this, the consolidation is in accordance with the will of the parties. Uh, so again, uh, and this of course as Alison uh, has uh, addressed in the beginning, given due process concerns and given the issue of not forcing parties to participate in, uh, in proceedings against their will, against of how they have uh, agreed, both in terms of consent and the procedures, uh, the way to resolve the issues is to include proper clauses in the arbitration agreement. Uh, disclosure. Uh, this is, uh, I think this is uh, probably the most difficult uh, issue to resolve when, for example, we have cases involving 
parties from different legal systems. And, and because of that, they have different expectations in terms of production of documents. Uh, Brazil, according to our Code of Civil Procedure, which sometimes is used as a, as a, as a subsidiary source for, for rules, uh, is, is very restrictive in terms of production of documents and, and of disclosure of documents uh, uh, throughout the proceedings. Uh, what has been happening in practice that uh, uh, I would say most arbitral tribunals here in Brazil uh, now they 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 use the EBA rules uh, as a guide to allow for a broader uh, request for documents, and uh, and, and this has uh, considerably expanded. The, the the scope of the scope in proceedings in in, 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 in Brazil and, and uh, with, respect, with respect to the enforcement of, of arbitral tribunals orders for disclosure I would say that most of those orders have been complied voluntarily by the parties and but if if those orders are not complied, uh, uh, arbitral tribunals can refer to the courts uh, for implementation of their decisions. Uh, we have now a, 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 a rule in, in our new Code of Civil Procedure in which uh, the courts need to be supportive of arbitral tribunals' decisions. It's, it, it's somehow unclear whether a, a, a broader order of, of enforcement of, uh, of, of disclosure of documents would be enforced in, by the courts in Brazil, but uh, the, the, the assumption that we have here, given the, this past 15, 20 years of case law on the matter, is that the courts have been extremely supportive of, 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 of the arbitrators in terms of making them work. So if uh, with respect to disclosure of documents, the impression that we have done here is that courts would, would be supportive of those decisions by arbitral tribunals. Mm. Uh, of course, our law uh, uh, provides specifically that if, 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 if documents are not voluntarily produced by uh, one of the parties, uh, the arbitrators may uh, draw adverse inferences from from the from the behavior of the party, and this I think this rule explains why in most cases the parties comply uh, voluntarily with the, the arbitral tribunal's orders in this regard. Attorneys' fees and 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 interest. Uh, uh, as a general matter, uh, uh, the arbitral tribunals and the, the domestic rules of arbitration in Brazil, they provide for reimbursement of costs, of reasonable costs that the parties have during the arbitration. And, and, and that's how they allocate uh, those costs at the end of, 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 the, uh, of the proceedings. What, what those rules do not provide are, are, are for fees that are owned directly to the attorneys that work on the case. And this is, is not an issue in many jurisdictions, but this is an issue in Brazil because uh, if you have a core proceeding, uh, the courts uh, have a duty to, at the end of the case, to, to set a fee for the attorneys of the winning party, and those fees are set according to the amount in dispute, okay? There are no, there are no similar rules for arbitration, so this provision does, does, does not apply in an arbitration unless the parties uh, include that in their agreement to, to arbitrate, which in most cases, in most of the cases that we, that we see here, it, it, it doesn't, 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 doesn't happen. Uh, with respect to, 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 to interest rates, uh, uh, normally, arbitral tribunals apply the same rules that are, uh, uh, that are applicable for court cases. 
so uh, it's a combination of monetary adjustment and, and interest. Uh, and normally the, 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 the reference, the interest rate reference that is used is CELIC, which is the national treasury rate, uh, which is uh, today at a, a, a very high level of 14.25% a year. Uh, with respect to the award, uh, the, the uh, uh, award must comply with with the with the same rules that apply for final court orders. So uh, arbitrators must give reasons uh, for for their decision. Uh, arbitrators must address all the relevant issues of, of, the, of the case that the parties have presented, have to evaluate the evidence properly and issue an award according to the case that has been presented to them. Uh, if for some reason uh, one of those issues are not addressed properly by the award, parties have uh, a, a right to, to request the tribunal to correct or clarify the award uh, under the deadline provided for in the Arbitration Act. Uh, and if, for example, if the tribunal refuses to correct and clarify the award, uh, the parties have the right, according to the amendment to the, to the Arbitration Act, to request a, a supplementary award. Uh, in addition to that, if uh, we have uh, 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 cases in which an after award may, may be set aside, of course, uh, the, the setting aside of the after award cannot be based on the merits of the decision. The merits of the decision is exclusive to the arbitrators to decide, but if there are grounds and, and usually are grounds relating to due process uh, violations to uh, to public policy violations and uh, and procedure violations if there is any violation uh, of of this nature a, a, the interested party have 90 days to file a motion to vacate the award and and, and this this is a mandatory deadline and, and, and if the party doesn't comply with that, with that deadline, uh, the decision of the arbitrators would not be able to be reviewed by courts any longer. Uh, uh, now, uh, another aspect of, of, of the, the amendment of the law is arbitration of public entities of, with the state. And again, uh, I'll let uh, Alison address that part. very new area of arbitration in Brazil. As we discussed earlier, uh, Brazil is not an ICSID member, so uh, it, it doesn't participate in the investor state arbitrations that are common for other countries. It has recently entered into the cooperation and facilitation investment agreement with the few countries, countries in which Brazilian investors have significant interests. And those do allow state-to-state -state, uh, arbitration. Um, so in, in contrast, what Brazil has done is in its 2015 amendment to the arbitration law, it clarified that the public administration could arbitrate disputes. It clarified that the entities, the public entities that um, could arbitrate were both direct and indirect. So direct administrative entities as well as indirect entities like um, Petrobras, for example, and that they, these, these entities could arbitrate disputes that are related to disposable economic rights. Again, these rights are economic rights that can be valued monetarily, so not um, legal rights, for, for example. 
the amendments do provide some requirements for these arbitrations. It will be interesting to see how these requirements play out and how the law develops. For example, the arbitrations must be decided based on the law, so they can't be decided based on equity. And they must also be public, so uh, there must be uh, public access to the arbitrations in some way that's under that's in discussion. The arbitrations themselves cannot be confidential, as uh, parties can decide to do in a normal arbitration or international arbitration. Because this is a new area of law, it's still nascent and we'll all be watching with interest how it develops, but it was very quickly used. So even though the amendments uh, were adopted and be, became active in mid-2015, already by the end of the year, 20 arbitrations involving public administrations had been filed with the six largest arbitral institutions in Brazil. So this does prove to be an interesting area of law to to watch and see how it develops. And again, it does seem like growth could occur quickly in this area, as with other aspects of uh, Brazilian arbitration. Now, Gustavo will discuss a few things regarding um, arbitrations involving Brazilian parties that are seated outside of Brazil. Okay, uh, first, uh, before addressing some of the specific issues in this regard, uh, uh, the important point here is, is to stress that uh, Brazilian law on arbitration uh, does not have a separate regime for international and national arbitration. Uh, the distinction that is made by law is arbitration whose seat is abroad and arbitration that takes place within the Brazilian territory. And, and basically the difference that is the arbitrations that take place outside Brazil needs to first pass through uh, the executor proceedings before our superior tribunal of justice in, some, in, in Brasilia, which is the, a, a high court in Brasilia who is responsible for examining uh, those foreign arbitral awards. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, first is, uh, first issue to consider is data protection laws. Uh, the, uh, Brazil, of course, provides a right of privacy, and we have uh, uh, laws providing for uh, for this uh, right, you know, and, and restricting the use of personal data. So, for example, we have rules on our consumer protection codes. Uh, we have laws regulating rights of minors, data of minors, and and and, and several different laws regarding a confidentiality of financial tax and telephone communications and all that. But we do not have a, a, a single and a specific law dealing with the uh, protection law. We have a bill uh, currently uh, in, in Congress uh, dealing uh, with that matter, but we have yet to have a, a single and comprehensive uh, uh, law uh, uh, on that regard. So uh, uh, questions, specific questions on this issue need to be made on a case-by-case -case basis and need to be uh, addressed to, to, to counsel under specific situations. Uh, uh, with respect to uh, enforcement of a war, uh, as I said, they need to be enforced, they need to be presented first to our uh, SDJ, the Superior Tribunal of Justice, uh, for uh, uh, executor. And the court uh, here will, will examine the foreign award according to the rules of the New York Convention. As we explained uh, in the beginning, uh, uh, Brazil is a signatory to the New York Convention since 2002. 
and, uh, and, and, and those are the grounds in which uh, enforcement is granted or denied. Uh, both entry and party awards are in, enforceable according to, uh, to, the, to the convention. Uh, the requirements of the, of the, of course, of the New York Convention must be respected, but the important thing is that the, the STJ, uh, as the general corps in, 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 in general, they have taken a very, a very uh, a friendly approach to arbitrations, uh, to foreign awards to be enforced in Brazil. Uh, uh, so, uh, Normally, no, no, no additional burdens are placed uh, in, 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 in the enforcement of those awards. Uh, I would, however, discuss a, a, a few uh, additional points on, on, on this. Uh, first is uh, the STJ has recently uh, uh, denied the enforcement of a foreign award that came from Argentina. And the reason why the award was denied enforcement was because the award had been uh, annulled at the place of, of the arbitration. Uh, it was an arbitration that had a seat in Argentina. The, the, the Argentinian court vacated the award and the interested parties brought the award to Brazil to uh, enforce here, regardless of the decision of the Argentinian courts. And uh, even though uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, there were some, some specific circumstances on that case, specifically regarding uh, legislation that applies for arbitrations regarding Mercosul, the agreement among the South American states, some of the South American states, uh, uh, the SDJ denies the enforcement, uh, saying that the, the, the annulment of, of that award at the place of origin was ground for, for denial. Uh, this has been discussed a lot in Brazil, whether that indicates that the, the STJ is, is not as pro-arbitration as, as most, most people thought at the beginning. Uh, but uh, the general uh, view here is that, uh, as a general matter, uh, the, the approach is, is a pro-arbitration approach. Another case that the enforcement was, uh, was denied uh, was a case that involved a, a Brazilian party uh, dealing with uh, uh, an English company uh, which had an arbitration under the Liverpool Cotton Association. In that case, because there was no agreement in writing, uh, actually, there, there was not even a, a contract among the parties. There was just a, 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 a purchase order. And by uh, the rules of the uh, Cotton, Liverpool Cotton Association, once that order was placed, the party placing the order automatically uh, adhered to the rules of that association. Uh, when the award was submitted here to the FCJ, the STJ uh, adopted uh, a restrictive view that the lack of a written agreement was a grounds for denial of the arbitral uh, of the arbitral award. Uh, and yet, in another case, also from the Liverpool Cotton Association, the STJ took a different view because, in the second case, the Brazilian party participated in the proceedings and did not object to the jurisdiction of the English arbitral tribunal. So in that case, the STJ uh, uh, said that, that the participation of the Brazilian party in the arbitration was enough to prove consent. So just to, to, to summarize here, uh, uh, even though uh, 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 there, there, are, there are those two cases in which denial was was the award, the, the enforcement was denied. Uh, in, in the vast majority of the cases, 
the SDJ has been very cooperative and has complied with the, with the norms and the spirit of the New York Convention. Uh, uh, one, one last remark in this regard, uh, maybe the difficulty that we are going to face in the future here uh, with the enforcement of, of foreign award is respect to time. If, for example, an international award is challenged before the STJ, uh, that challenge can take more or less two years before the STJ uh, grants its uh, executor uh, on the case. So one alternative for that is if, if, if foreign parties uh, uh, know in advance that the enforcement uh, is going to take place in Brazil, and considering that the, the Brazilian courts are, are not, have, have not interfered with the, with the arbitral uh, proceedings and award. On the contrary, they have been extremely supportive of arbitration in Brazil. And, and, and also considering that parties may choose the law to the proceedings and to the merits of, of their case, a, a, an alternative that has been adopted by many foreign companies here in Brazil is to select Brazil as a seat of the arbitration. And, and, and thereby avoiding the, the, the entire uh, executor proceedings before uh, the, the, the STJ. Uh, well, in, 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 in this regard, uh, uh, this is, is pretty much what we had to, uh, to say about arbitration in Brazil today. Uh, uh, we are, of course, we are open for, for q and A. If, if if you want to uh, make questions, and uh, and and if not, if you, if you want to ask questions for us later, you can uh, send us emails uh, for Alison or myself. We are going to be uh, pleased to answer any questions that you have. Uh, thank you. As Gustavo said, we have allocated about 15 minutes or so for questions, so um, please don't hesitate to provide any through the WebEx. Okay, we have one question here uh, by Susan Bluton. Uh, she's asking whether damages uh, would be considered disposable economic rights. Uh, yes, actually this is, is the typical case in which uh, uh, arbitration could be used for, for, uh, to, to settle dispute with the, with the state. For example, it, it, it's very common that the state is the owner of, of, of a, a, a construction contract. And for many reasons, the, the constructor has suffered damages because uh, the state has not uh, uh, complied with the contractual terms and therefore have, have caused, has caused damages to the private party. Uh, this is a, a typical uh, uh, example in which arbitration the, the dispute is arbitrable because certainly damages is under the, the, the concept of disposable economic rights. Okay, we have another question, Patrick Jakes, Jakes, Jackson, uh, and he's asking if we have seen here a, a long delays in enforcing foreign arbitration awards. Uh, Yes. Uh, for example, there is now pending in the in the in the STJ a case. It's the Abengoa versus uh, uh, the Dinio Meto case. Uh, it's a case in which 
Uh, it was an arbitration in U.S., in New York. Uh, Abengoa was the successful partner in arbitration. Uh, the Dino Meto filed to vacate the award, alleging that the chairman of that tribunal had not disclosed certain facts of the, of the case. And, and because of that, the case was challenged before the federal courts in the U.S. Uh, the federal courts uh, denied the request to set aside that actual award. And uh, when Abengoa brought the, the, the award here to Brazil to ask for enforcement, uh, the, the award was challenged on the very same grounds here in Brazil, and it's pending before the STJ for the past uh, three to four years. So yes, uh, 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 if, again, if the award is challenged before the STJ, and if the challenge is somehow a complex one, it may take a, a, a quite a while for enforcement to take place. That's why I, I said that uh, uh, opting for choosing Brazil as a seat, I think it's, it, it has become a very uh, sensible alternative for foreign parties. Uh, Okay. If I could, if I could add on to that, Gustavo, I agree with what you said, and just want to add that, uh, in my experience, which involves, uh, in large part, um, Brazil arbitrations with Brazilian parties in arbitration seated outside of Brazil, it is common, in my experience, for um, parties to voluntarily comply. Brazilian parties to voluntarily comply with the arbitration awards um, because there is a pro-arbitration stance and the STJ does um, enforce arbitration awards and has such a pro-arbitration stance. They're likely to comply and given that the enforcement can take time, you know, there generally is interest that's accruing as a motion to vacate goes through or as the enforcement process winds. That can be an incentive. Uh, that interest can be an incentive to voluntarily comply to avoid the accrual of, of interest during that time. Definitely. Uh, we have one que another question here, uh, also by Suzanne Bussin. How do costs in arbitration compare to re regular litigation? This is a very, very good question. Uh, uh, in, in, in many countries, you see that the, the, the recourse to arbitration uh, uh, takes costs as one of the key uh, 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 decisive elements for opting for arbitration especially in countries where you have a very considerable cost with, the, uh, with discovery proceedings. Uh, <laughs> opting for arbitration normally uh, uh, implies a considerable reduction on cost. And that's not the case in Brazil with respect to domestic arbitrations because uh, 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 Court litigation is not expensive in Brazil at all. It's it's not it's very accessible, and 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 this is one of the reasons why we have 100 million cases pending before the state and federal courts in this country because it's it, it's not it's not expensive at all to have a court case here in this country. So the 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 option for arbitration in Brazil. Uh, uh, was is explained by different reasons, I think. I think that the three key factors to explain the, the preference for arbitration in Brazil is time. I would say that most cases would be, even complex ones, would be decided between 18, 12 to 24 months after the tribunal is, is, is constituted. Uh, uh, I would say that neutrality is, 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 is relevant uh, because the parties uh, in some disputes think that 
uh, moving away from courts, especially in a country as as, as big as as, as Brazil, uh, arbitration may provide a neutral forum forum for parties from different states, and also uh, expertise. Uh, considering some very complex disputes that we have in Brazil right now in regard to energy, oil and gas, uh, infrastructure, uh, telecommunications, and uh, uh, expertise has become a very, very relevant factor when deciding to, to to, to, to opt for arbitration. So, uh, in my view here, uh, cost is, is not the driving factor because arbitration in Brazil is more expensive than court litigation. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, feel free to reach out to us. As we said earlier, our email addresses are on the screen. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to receiving any follow-up questions by email.